In 1996, Italian mineralogist Vincenzo Di Michele spotted an unusual yellow-green gem within one of Tutankhamun's necklaces. The jewel was tested and found to be made of a type of glass known as Libyan desert glass. The interesting thing regarding this, however, is its origins. To this day, no one seems to be able to explain how it formed. No trace of a crater has ever been discovered. An ancient meteorite, or indeed outer space object, scorching across the skies of Egypt is the basis for many religious teachings within this once amazing ancient civilization. They associated the objects and the flaming tails during such events with that of a phoenix, and the collected items, presumably nearly always meteorites, were then hammered down into wares. Nine small beads, stored at the University College London's Petrie Museum, dated to around 3200 BC, were found in necklaces along with exotic terrestrial minerals such as lapis lazuli, agate, and gold. They are some of the earliest iron artifacts ever found, and archaeologists have confirmed that they came from outer space. Meteoric iron is much harder and more brittle than copper. Quote, they were rolled and hammered into shape. This is a very different technology from the usual stone bead drilling, and shows quite an advanced understanding, showing the metalsmiths knew exactly how to work this rather difficult material," said Thilo Rarin, a University College London professor of archaeology. When American geophysicist John Wasson was consulted regarding King Tut's strange gem, he curiously linked the event with one within an extremely remote forest of Siberia, an event we have covered before. Quote, when the thought came to me that this required a hot sky, I thought immediately of the Tunguska event, he told Horizon. In 1908, a massive explosion flattened 80 million trees in Tunguska, Siberia. And whatever landed there over a century ago is still there, and it kills any living organism which settles above it. And what is most interesting surrounding all of this is the ancient Egyptian accounts of what they did with a rather peculiar, rather special type of object that was, at one point, retrieved from the glassy sands of Libya. A particularly different object, which they called a phoenix egg. That hieroglyph state was secreted away within a secret chamber deep within the Great Pyramid. We have covered before the hypothesis that these stories etched in hieroglyphics may be far older than the Egyptian culture which may have preceded it. Yet the question is clear. What could this phoenix egg be? Tutankhamun is not only the most famous of all the pharaohs, but he is unquestionably the character most wrapped in mystery. Although many are attracted to the legends of the unexplained curse or flock to the Cairo Museum to peer upon his wondrous relics, what many are unaware of is a rather incredible theory pertaining to an as yet undiscovered vault hidden in plain sight within his own purported ancient tomb. Known as the Second Chamber Theory, it was initially put forward by British Egyptologist Nicholas Reeves. He argued that it was the secret burial chamber of Nefertiti, who was originally the wife of Tutankhamun's father, Akhenaten. Legends say that she was one of the most beautiful women in history. Reeves argues that, due to King Tut dying suddenly, he was hastily buried in the outer chamber of Nefertiti's tomb, with the opening to her chamber then concealed somewhere within the tomb many millennia ago. Again, a tomb unlooted, filled to the rafters with priceless golden relics. Reeves even claims that he himself detected a hidden passageway behind a funerary painting on one of the walls of the tomb. Thus, in 2016, an American survey team harnessing ground-penetrating radar peered into and beyond the walls within the tomb. However, they were unable to confirm nor reject the second chamber theory. Yet this did not dissuade anyone who had become convinced of the theory, coming to this conclusion via different avenues of study, continuing to be convinced of the theory's validity. So, after another unsuccessful attempt, a third was arranged by a new Minister of Antiquities set at a media conference, stating he would conduct a third GPR analysis to, quote, put an end to the debate. The third survey, led by Francesco Porcelli, 
of the Polytechnic University of Turin, subsequently came forward to publicly state, beyond doubt, that there was no hidden chambers within the tomb. However, this entire sequence of events can simply be perceived as a rather hazy attempt to put people off from covering this story, diverting attention away from its possible truth. Firstly, why three attempts to confirm that a chamber did not exist? For why would the first two attempts have openly admitted that they were not able to confirm such claims without doubt? How could a person from such an institution, if not funded to come to such a definitive conclusion, make such a post-statement? And why would so many from different academic backgrounds arrive at the same conclusion? Is there a secret chamber in King Tut's tomb? And if so, why is it being hidden? What could be inside it? We find the possibilities incredibly intriguing. Who built the Great Pyramids? How? Why? Questions many have attempted but seemingly failed to answer. Although claimed as tombs, with the different internal chambers within the largest, Khufu, named in representation of this purpose. Interestingly, Khufu, or Cheops, is the only one of the three pyramids with internal chambers. The other smaller two merely have tunnels beneath. An enigmatic box, whose lid has long been lost to history, lay within this enormous structure, long claimed to have been the sarcophagus of Khufu. However, although suspiciously small, no one seems to be able to explain how they got it into the chamber in the first place. It is as if the pyramid was built around, as it doesn't fit through any of the known entranceways. Since the 19th century, when these chambers were first rediscovered, a tremendous amount of research, though it must be noted, always supervised by official Egyptian antiquity academics, nonetheless, remarkable discoveries have at least been partially shared with the world. Most notably, Gantenbrink's door. Yet the tomb of Osiris, where this once inaccessible tunnel led, was, once the media was permitted back into the location, found empty claimed by officials as being found conveniently vacant. A room only discovered thanks to 21st century technology, according to mainstream Egyptologists, was somehow looted. However, there still lay many mysteries within this most intriguing of structures, and we would expect at least one, or possibly many more, which no matter how long it takes us to rediscover them, will be too big to hide. For example, Although we once thought the tomb Gantenbrink discovered was inaccessible, the chamber at the top of the structure, one of considerable size, estimated at 30 square meters, is so inaccessible. It was only found with technology used to register cosmic rays. a technology usually utilized in high-energy particle physics, capable of tracking particles called muons, produced when cosmic rays strike atoms in the upper atmosphere. These incredibly sensitive detectors were first developed for use in particle accelerators, but they have also been used to gaze into the inner bowels of many geological and ancient artificial features. In December 2015, Physicist Kunihiro Morishima of Nagoya University, Japan, placed detectors inside the Queen's chamber to detect muons passing through the pyramid. Thus, any large chamber still hidden within the pyramid would be detected due to a higher register of muons than expected from denser angles. The chamber's discovery was corroborated by two other teams of physicists. All three teams observed a large void in the same location above the Grand Gallery. It was a big surprise, says Tayubi. We're really excited, he continued. The researchers say it might even be made up of two or more smaller spaces. Tayubi suggests that it could be, quote, 
a second grand gallery. It is a discovery which we are... On the 25th of January, 2011, the streets of Cairo were being ravaged by a rioting population, demanding the end of President Hosni Mubarak's 30-year regime. While the world was distracted by the dramatic scenes of chaos upon the streets above, deep within the ancient dusty tunnels, a team of archaeologists led by Suzanne Bickel of the University of Basel in Switzerland was quietly making one of the most significant discoveries of the past century. They had initially found the top of a large round stone at the eastern end of the Valley of the Kings. The archaeologists suspected that it was just the top of an abandoned shaft, but before they could investigate, due to Egypt's political process regarding finds within the valley, they had to cover the stone rim with their own locked iron door, inform the Egyptian authorities, and apply for an official permit to excavate. A year later, after gaining approval to excavate, Bickel returned with a team of two dozen people, including field director Elena Paula Goth of the University of Basel, Egyptian inspector Ali Rita, and local workmen. Each took turns lying on the ground, head pressed against the shaft wall, one arm through a small hole next to the capstone, snapping photographs. They left little doubt that it was indeed an ancient tomb. On top of the debris rested a dusty black coffin, carved from sycamore wood and decorated with large yellow hieroglyphs on its sides and top. Bickel has stated that she has never seen an Egyptian coffin in such a good condition before. The dating of fragments of pottery made from Nile silt and pieces of plaster, commonly used to seal tomb entrances in ancient times, together with the age of the other nearby sites, have indicated that the tomb could be more than 3,000 years old. The hieroglyphs describe the tomb's occupant as being named Nahimi's Bastet. Egyptologists currently believe she was a lady of the upper class and of Amun. People have been claiming there was nothing new left to find in the Valley of the Kings for almost as long as they have been digging there. The Venetian antiquarian Giovanni Belzoni believed he had emptied the last of the valley's tombs during his 1817 expedition, while Theodore Davis, who excavated there a century later, came to a similar conclusion right before Tutankhamun's burial chamber was found. Fortunately, there is a growing number of people who are beginning to suspect that there is a wealth of discoveries still left to be made in the Valley of the Kings, the Nile Delta, and Egyptian as a whole. And thanks to discoveries such as these, interest in these existing mysteries grows by the day. It is interesting to see that in this period, even a wealthy girl was buried with quite simple things, Bickel says, comparing Nahim's Bastet's coffin and steel with the elaborate pottery, furniture, and food found in earlier tombs. Her wooden coffin was certainly quite expensive, she says, but nonetheless, it lacked the elaborate inner coffins found in similar burials. Is this the burial chamber of an extremely ancient queen? After reinforcing the coffin and securing the mummy, Bickel's team have transported across the Nile to Luxor, where a full investigation is currently being undertaken into the true identity of the mystery female. With substantial insight into the controversial finds within ancient Egypt, we personally suspect that often the tombs, which appear the most crudely designed, containing wooden sarcophagus, are generally found to be the most ancient. Furthermore, their hieroglyphic writings were often far more exquisite in nature. Could this be the discovery of an original burial? And the crude hieroglyphic claim of the occupant's identity a fake? Hiding the delta's true antiquity? A secret many fringe scientists have begun to believe is being protected by Egyptian antiquities. Many have come to suspect the Egyptians merely copied the original builders of the pyramids, after taking occupation of their structures many years later. Supportive evidence for these claims comes in many forms. Erosion upon the pyramids, and especially the Sphinx, including over 100 underground chambers we are currently researching discovered under Giza in 1995 by a team led by Kent Weeks, which also show strong evidence of several flash flooding events 
involving seawater throughout their long existence. The lack of any written detail pertaining to the construction of either monument in any hieroglyphs found in ancient Egypt, and so on. We find it incredibly intriguing that more was not made public regarding this amazing find, which leads us to suspect it may be a highly important, albeit highly controversial, discovery. We will continue to do research on Nahem's Bastet and will endeavor to keep you all informed regarding any notable findings. Discovered in 1860 within the astounding Valley of the Kings, the Atlantis Ring has since proven to have been a most incredible of finds, not only for the secret sacred geometry that was found to have been inscribed upon this seemingly insignificant clay ring, but also for the strange, seemingly reoccurring pattern of curses or good luck talismans wrapped around the entire magic of this once incredible yet now lost civilization. Once discovered, it was said to cast a protective spell upon those who wore it, a supposed positive energy force that although as strange as that of the curse of Tutankhamun, is one that is far less mentioned within the career and discoveries of Howard Carter himself. This, regardless of the fact that it has since gone on to be an incredibly popular mass-produced product, once kept secret for many years by Carter himself. Also now sold under the claim that it does indeed emit a powerful energy field around the wearer. The science behind these claims we cannot claim to understand. However, the ring's modern popularity along with the lack of coverage regarding this possible legend within the discussion of Howard Carter's career, we have found peculiar. Featuring two triangles, six small and three larger rectangles with a semi-cylindrical form, it was originally found by Marquis de Grain. A blueprint of the ring was soon sent to Carter himself, who made and wore a secret replica which he kept himself until his death in 1939. In 1922, Carter would discover King Tut's tomb. Before opening the tomb, hieroglyphics above the tomb's unbroken seal were read. It said, The wings of death shall touch all who violates the Pharaoh's eternal rest. Unperturbed, they opened the tomb, discovering treasures beyond all of their wildest imaginations. Yet, as warned, all who were involved in this discovery eventually met curious fates. With just Carter himself left, the one person who was undeniably the most guilty party in the entire excavation. He would not die until 17 years later, at the reasonably young age of 66. During these 17 years, however, the flurry of media attention around the claimed curse persisted. Interestingly, whenever asked how he had seemingly escaped the curse for so long, he would always reply that he had a secret talisman a good luck charm that protected him from the curse. This initial cast of the ring Carter had made, it turns out, he seemingly knew of its incredibly important geometric significance. Yet it was not until 1940, while going through his documents, that his studies and indeed rules of wearing the ring were revealed to the world. His talisman, a replica of the Atlantis ring, a relic many thousands of years old, Originally made from Eswan and clay, like something out of a Holy Grail story, it seems the least valuable, seemingly most conspicuous of finds turned out to be one of the most, if not the most valuable to Howard himself. Out of all the golden wonders he had ever unearthed, this one, one which he didn't even discover himself, he kept closest to his heart. It is because of this that we find the Atlantis ring highly compelling. To truly understand the astonishingly true history of the unfinished obelisk, one must first wade through a quagmire of well-financed fallacy, infested with many a false prophet, incomplete or simply illogical conjecture, all of which defended by countless academic figures of institutions of influence and power, acquired via the funding in their defense of a form of mass worship of academics' perception, as if an all-knowing authority. So, with things like the obelisk, for example, one begins to wonder if this all be by design. Since academic records of this monument began, 
no one who has described it, predictably, has ever managed to wrap their head around how such a stone could have possibly ever been moved. Ergo, all well-funded explorers, reporters, and journalists alike, with the expectant pressure of their return with a deciphered mystery. It would appear this explanation never arose, yet was skillfully averted. Firstly, the rock had indeed been abandoned abruptly at some point in history, conveniently allowing academia to make nearly all those interested in the obelisk overlook this eventual intention by its original creators, a distraction made by a fault line. Chris Dunn, an independent investigator held in varied regard, found that details of decoration were already being added to the stone as it was being hewn, running exactly through this so-called fault, disproving this so long-held academic fallacy. Yet, alas, although the unfinished obelisk lay still attached to the strata of Earth, like that of the larger of the two megaliths in Yangsham Quarry, the largest some 16,000 tons, academia is not required nor would even attempt to provide any logical explanation as to how these blocks would have been moved. Additionally, however, and perhaps most revealing, is the pregnant lady of Lebanon, a 1,000-plus ton megalith, so large that just like that of the unfinished obelisk, no attempt was ever made to explain the ancient civilization responsible could have moved such stones to their final placements. Yet, remarkably, the proverbial nail in the coffin and vindication of our claim was the excavations made around the pregnant woman, recently revealing that this stone was not abandoned on a slight incline, as claimed, but was placed atop another stone of even bigger proportions, suggesting it was part of a once enormous structure and exposing this reoccurring academic strategy when it comes to dismissing the controversial. It is a reality which we find incredibly annoying.